We're going to talk now uh, to a gentleman by the name of Richard Martin, who's co-owner of the Blazing Donkey Country Hotel near Sandwich in Kent, which is a very lovely part of the world. If you've never been to Sandwich, um, it is a, a remarkable uh, part of the sort of Sank Ports. It's one of those towns on the southeast corner uh, of this country, like Deal. Uh, they've got Royal St George's, where they play the, the, the Open uh, Golf Championship. It's not that far from Rye, another beautiful city, town. Another, it's not that far from Dover either. But let's find out what happened when Richard was offered the opportunity to close his hotel, fire all of his staff, and only take illegal migrants for the rest of time. Uh, very, very good morning to you, Richard. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. My pleasure. Um, tell us how it all sort of uh, happened, first of all, because presumably you, you got a phone call or you got approached by somebody? It wasn't originally a phone call, no. We had an email from an agency that were working on behalf of the government right. home office right. and uh, that, that email suggested that they could offer us 100 percent occupancy over a 12-month term right which all sounded too good to be true mm. of course um so um i picked the phone up you couldn't get through on the phone so you had to book a zoom meeting with these agents right. uh, so the, the following morning we zoomed in and uh, i had an explanation from the agency that they were acting on behalf of uh, the, the Home Office to secure accommodation for um, asylum seekers, right. effectively. Um, now, at the Blazing Donkey, we host around 100 weddings a year, 8,000 guests come to stay each year. We've got a, a well-established business that our family's built up since 92. I've worked here since. Mm. So um, that's our life's work, pretty much. And we're, we're lucky insofar as that hard work's paid off for us. So if we were to accept something like this, um, then overnight um, our business would effectively be trashed by way of its reputation yeah. and probably the fa fabric of the property as well from what I've been hearing. Yeah. Um, but, but it, it, you know, it, it was quite staggering because when I delved deeper to find out what was actually being offered, um, it was uh, to take all of the accommodation on 100% occupancy and computing over um, the, um, the period, it, it actually worked out to, to be a million and 80,000 um, in total. Wow. So. Um, just under 1.1 million, right. uh, which is it's a, a lot of money, isn't it? For, yeah, it, it, it is. It is a lot of money. I mean, because presumably you, as most hoteliers uh, operate, don't operate with fully uh, occup full occupancy at all times. So, I mean, for a lot no. of people, that would be quite an attractive proposition. Well, even at much higher rates, uh, 60 percent to 65, which is what our annualised occupancy is, um, it was a lot more than we would usually enjoy. Right. But it, you know, it's, it would only ever be a short-term hit. Right. Um, and uh, and you know with with our duty of care not just to our customers but to 25 staff here it was never going to be a possibility or, or a consideration right. for us well frankly. that's the other bit isn't it because they would have asked you to get rid of all of your staff and would you have been given money then to make them redundant how would that have worked well um we, would, we weren't told that so much as um that all they required was the accommodation none of the catering to go with it now 95 percent of my staff are catering staff mm. so by virtue of the provision, we wouldn't need those staff, so they would have to be uh, all asked to step down from from their yeah. roles. Um, if so, we if they didn't want, so if they didn't want you to provide catering, does that mean they're using an outside catering company then? The conversation and the, the the exchange didn't get into that much detail, but I do understand from other hotels that have entered these agreements that the the government use a third party contractor to provide the meals and services to. Uh, these asylum seekers. Right. Yeah, that's how. It, uh, yeah, that's and how, how many it rooms do you have there? How many rooms, rooms? do you have? So uh, across the site, we've got uh, 22 hotel rooms, and we've got um, a high-end glamping site called the Ham Hideaway, right. which can sleep up to a further 20. So we can sleep around 65 to 70 guests on the property, okay. based on two two guests per room. So. Um, a small hotel, um, but uh, obviously large enough for, the, for it to be on the government's radar yeah. for accommodation. But, well, I think, but I think totally, the, I think totally the, unsuited, really. I think the problem they've got, Richard, is that they're using so many hotels that they're running out of room because the problem is, is these people come in, they don't seem to go anywhere, they don't seem to move yeah. out of the hotels. I mean, I, I actually had an immigration... Um, department minister on a few months ago and I said how long do these people stay in these hotels and he went oh just a couple of days which is plainly incorrect because we know from just a sort of anecdotal experience of talking to people that people are in these hotels for months on end and if they're booking yeah. you for a year I mean I don't yeah. know whether they mentioned this did they say what the turnover rate would be how long people would be there for they actually didn't um, it, before we got to that stage it was something that I said it wouldn't be attractive to us um, and I had no idea until 
this approach came along, just how much of this is going on. Um, I am aware that in our area, the two major Holiday Inn franchisees have turned themselves over to um, the asylum seeker mm. market. But uh, I think that speaks volumes about their business models, mm. frankly. Um, well, it does, uh, seem, you know, yeah, it does seem as though the chain hotels are more likely to do it because for them, they don't really have any loyalty to their customers anyway. Correct, correct. Yeah. Right. I mean, our customer, I mean, our, our custom, our, our chief income stream is weddings. And mm. you know, we've got local families predominantly that have their weddings and, and through generations now over very many years. We were the first property to be licensed for outdoor weddings back in 96. Right. Um, and we haven't looked back since. It's a big part of what we do. So to remove that would be a community asset gone. Yes, absolutely right. And were they disappointed when you said no, thank you? Well, I think um, they're once removed from the government, and so the, these guys are just agents doing their job. So yeah. there was really no um, heart in it. It was just they're looking for for accommodation, and they don't care where they get it from. Yeah. Um, but so, so there was no expression of disappointment. It, the meeting was ended pretty swiftly, and mm. um, we dismissed it. Uh, so they've moved on to the next victim, if you like. But listen, uh, Richard, appreciate your time. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and good luck with the business going forward, because Richard Martin is the salt of the earth type of businessman in this country. He said no to the Home Office. He said no uh, to their messengers. He said no to kicking out uh, all of his staff because they would bring in outside caterers. He also said no to over a million pounds being offered. And by the way, let's not forget, that's your money, that's my money, that's our money being offered to private business in order to house a load of people who shouldn't even be here. Just let that sink in.